The working environment needs to be fun. Everything you're doing in life needs to be fun. How do we support our own institutions? How do we support our own businesses? We feel that with the black man spending $20 billion a year, not setting up any businesses, not creating any industry, not creating any job opportunities for his own family, he's not in a moral position to tell the white man that he's discriminating against him. And instead of breaking somebody down, I look at what they do great and I go, wow, people that love and really want great for themselves go, what are they doing right? What's good? Welcome to another episode of This Black is Lit. I'm your host, Town, here on location at the University of Arkansas Multicultural Center. And today I'm joined by the brilliantly black and talented, Mr. Adrian Smith. Appreciate you, brother. Appreciate you stopping by the show today. No doubt. Um, we, uh, we're excited to be here and talking to you uh, about everything that's going on here at the Multi, man. So um, first, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, tell, tell us where you're from originally. So I'm originally from the small town of Rise in Arkansas, right outside of um, Pine Bluff. Again, you know, we utilize the big city of Little Rock as, as a uh, jump off point, but directly down south, bro. And how did you get here to Northwest Arkansas? So I originally did my um, undergrad at the University of Central Arkansas. Um, I wanted to, for sure, um, remain um, close to home. Um, that was a critical part of that piece. Um, when I went to UCA, I knew that I was going to get my master's um, in something. So coming here to the University of Arkansas made um, sense. It was a little further north, um, an opportunity for, for great education, um, but also remain close to home, close to family. So how did you get interested in higher education? So um, in undergrad, I was involved in everything. Um, part of it was if I was going to be part of it, I was going to be leading it. Um, but in that, a lot of that was through the mentors that I had. Um, and so recognizing um, the programmatic pieces, the mentorship pieces, um, people investing and pouring into you. Um, just having a conversation of, wow, like, you guys get paid for this? Um, and so really looking at it from the standpoint of um, my, not, my naivete of this is not community service. People are actually um, getting paid to um, invest in students to educate. Um, I often thought even in undergrad at one point I was going to be an education major um, in the K-12. Um, and so education has always been a critical part of, 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 my, of my being, of what the value of it, um, the access, again, coming from a um, small town, single parent, um, recognizing that, again, education has the ability to create access and a passport to a better life, um, but not just for myself, but also for others. Um, and when I look back over the life of the people who were really important to me, it was traditionally those who were um, involved in educational life, whether it was you know, teachers in high school, football coaches, and then getting to college to college administrators and even professors. Um, as well, and so higher education was um, part of what I feel, you know, it's part of my, my assignment um, and part of my purpose as well. Again, those who really helped me grow and develop um, was doing my time in college um, and the role that they played was so critical in who I am, what I am, and really shaping my values and beliefs um, and that have propelled me to where I'm, um, you know, currently at the Multicultural Center serving as um, a director at a major research one institution. Um, and at what moment did that passion for education become real for you, to, for you to pursue the position that you're in currently? So for me, um, ironically, um, my sister's also in higher education. Um, she's a, I'm a college, college student administrator as well. She's at Carnegie Mellon. And so our paths have always been what I say parallel. Um, I appreciate her. Um, being a trailblazer in my life in a lot of ways. She had already set um, a high standard, um, but also um, created a pathway um, in terms of a lot of the barriers and challenges that she had to deal with. Now we had knowledge and we had insight and somebody to pour back um, into me. And so um, when I was getting ready to graduate, um, my undergrad was in um, sociology and community information system. So I knew I wanted to work with people in the relational um, aspect of that, but she had actually came here to U of A as well um, to major in uh, higher education administration. And so just engaging in some conversations with her about why, and so engaging in some conversations with her about, um, hey, I really think I want to try this uh, college thing and to be administrator like um, some of the people who poured into me back at, you know, at Conway from 
you know, the, you know Ronnie Williams, uh, Wendy Holbrook, Crystal Hill, um, and, you know, and the list goes on. But those are, you know, definitely individuals. Um, you know, Dr. Calhoun who was an educator um, as well. Um, so, you know, just thinking about all those individuals, um, you know, on campus professors like um, Dr. Damon Taylor in the history department who taught me about what it meant to be black and to own my identity. I think just as I was getting ready to figure out what was next, it was just like, well, what do you see yourself? And what I saw myself was a lot of those individuals who had invested in me, um, that I wanted to be the same for somebody else. Working hard, um, oftentimes it's not about you. Um, and so really that value of, of, of giving of yourself to others. Um, discipleship, definitely. Um, but, but again, being alignment with what it is that you feel God was calling. That's awesome. It's almost like you've been doing this your whole life. Mm -hmm. um, so tell me a little bit about the successes that you've had in your journey in higher education. So uh, part of that, I, I think for me, my success really comes from uh, looking back now. Um, I've been in the field you know, 15 years as a full-time professional. The, the impact that I had on certain students um, and seeing what they are accomplishing now and knowing that I had a, a small part, or even somewhat a large part, um, of that, I was actually cleaning out my garage this week, and I was looking at some, I always keep like thank you cards and things of that nature because on those rough days when you're just busy and you're taxed and you feel like you're not making any impact, I pull those things out to, to be regrounded. And so even going through that, I was like, wow. But just to see where they have transitioned um, and, and the impact that they're having um, as, as professionals and for me, you know, there are several stories of, of, of other students who are doing such great things and phenomenal things um, in, in life um, that to know that I played a part in that um, and that they still, you know, reach back out um, when they are being challenged or they have difficulties because they still trust me, they still value um, the relationship, but also value that um, I'm going to shoot it to them straight. Um, I'm going to do whatever it is that I can to assist and support. So I think the success piece of that is just, you know, seeing the impact and, and really helping cultivate people um, to be their best um, and to live out their dreams. So what challenges have you faced along your, your journey in trying to help people bring the best out of themselves? I think for me, um, the most difficult part and the most challenging part is when you have to kill someone's dream. Um, and that's always challenging because they're so passionate about it. Um, they have such, you know, vivid uh, images of what that will be and what they look like, but yet, you know, situationally says that they can't. You know, whether that's, um, I want to be an engineer and, and I'm passionate about engineering, but you just don't have the math aptitude. And so again, you want to be in, in the health-related field, you want to be able to help people as it relates to uh, something around health. Nursing may not be what it, what it may be for you because you know your GPA now is a 2.8. We know the average GPA for an applicant in nursing is almost a 3.6 and not a 3.7. Like, there's no way you're gonna be able to make that up. And so those are, for me, probably the most challenging when I know people are putting in the work, have the desire and the passion for, but the circumstances whatever it may be, oftentimes it falls to uh, academically, they're just unable to meet the core requirements that it, that it takes to be successful. And so again, what can we do to reimagine this, to rethink this, and to re-strategize a way to move forward to where you're still able to do what drew you to the medical field or to nursing or you know accounting or engineering um, that still makes um, a level of of happiness for you and joy and passion where you can make the difference that you want to make or even make the money that you want to make that may not necessarily look how you originally envisioned it. Mm -hmm. And those redirection points are are seminal, especially when you're talking about college age uh, students trying to identify what their future is going to be. Mm -hmm. And just 
providing that clarity or that honesty or that truth is is the best thing that they can use in those times to to reimagine themselves or to recreate a vision for their life. So that's that's it's it's, it's just it's integral to have people like you in those times providing that type of insight to, to help in their development. Um, so what advice would you give to a young person who's aspiring for a career in higher education? So I would say for anyone who's aspiring for a career in higher education, you know, the size of your why really dictates the, the size of your commitment too. You know, and so my why is very big. And for me, it's without education, there's no way that I could be where I'm at. In, in, in any endeavor, uh, Organizationally, people are your greatest resource. Um, having the ability to work with and through people, um, having the ability to, to understand people um, is a critical part of, of that. So one of my most powerful questions that I often ask students is, so what, now what? Um, and so that doesn't matter whether you're doing outstanding, and if you are, so what? You know, Now what are you gonna do? I think the heart and core of that, again, is, is, is your why big enough? Um, and again, do you, do you have a heart for people? Um, because if you have a heart for people, you have the ability to meet them wherever they're at. Um, and again, how those un honest and authentic conversations across that spectrum. Yeah, and at both ends of the spectrum, it sounds like you're providing a, a motivation, a push. Mm -hmm. like, no matter if you're achieving well, okay, what's next? And even if somebody doesn't have the confidence that they should be here, you give them, okay, so what, you're here, let's get this done. And that's, motivation is, is the majority of the battle, you mm -hmm. know, continuing to stay motivated towards success. Um, so where can we find out more about uh, the work that you're doing here at the Multicultural Center? So totally, um, our, our motto at the Multicultural Center is all are welcome. Um, this year, what we just simply say is meet me at the MC because it's the place to be. I'm a place to belong, to become, and to be you. And again, the belonging piece, which belonging says there's both place and space. Um, and so part of what we're in, engaged in is providing an actual space. We're located here in the Arkansas Union Room 404. So there's always an opportunity to come by the center to find community, build community, um, come in and get academic resources, whether it's uh, taking advantage of our, our tutoring, come and taking advantage of our coffee that we have daily, our snacks, um, some of the various spaces that are dedicated strictly as academic spaces um, as well, even in our lounge area. So whether you just want to come in and plug in, sit down, chill out, um, but more importantly, the people in here who are truly invested um, in your success and who, as, as I'll continue to say, that not just me, um, the entire office staff that wants to partner with you. Um, and I think that's the motivation piece that you're talking about. As long as you're motivated, I'm going to be motivated. And I'm going to do any and everything that I possibly can to ensure um, that you are as successful as you want to be. Another thing I tell students, um, if I don't know, I can't help. Um, if I don't see you, I can't help. If I don't know you, if I don't see you, um, I can't engage in that and I have a strong desire um, for that um, always. And so definitely come by the MC, um, see me, um, see the rest of the staff, chill out if it's for 10 minutes or, or for, for two hours. Um, we definitely want to make that happen. And where can students find out more about the MC online? So definitely uh, we're actually in the process of updating our website. Um, so that's one of our major goals, but um, just multiculturalcenter.uark.edu. Um, so on social media, we're located at uark uh, underscore MC. Uh, so definitely come meet us at, you know, check us out on social media. We know food is a major part of, of, of the college experience and the lack thereof oftentimes. We try to have food daily as much as we can, but if we have an event and there's leftovers, you know, we're definitely gonna uh, bring them into the center and put it out on the group and say, come by. We're actually, um, you know, in the process of, of, of really rethinking um, that piece of how we better connect with students as well. Already. Um, well, we definitely appreciate you stopping by the show with us today. Uh, and we appreciate everything that you're doing here in the community and on campus. Um, we're proud of all the work that you're uh, accomplishing and we're excited to see you be a visionary that's creating change for people like you and me. So everybody, be sure to come by the MC, stop by the Union Room uh, 404, check out the MC online. Um, if you guys uh, have any questions, you can find out more at multiculturalcenter.uark.edu. Um, and up next on this Black and Slit, we're going to have another episode of Get Out Your Feelings and our word of the day. What's good?
It's your boy Town the Hood Scholar. It's time to get out your feelings. and I want some real simple answers. You understand? Hmm. Now you see now, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Today, we're going to talk about the mastery of time. Now, more than ever, we have a greater understanding of the value of time. Time is the only vehicle that flies by and drags its feet. The amount of time it takes to show kindness is the same amount of time that it takes to kill or to spread contagion. Quickly, our time on Earth begins, and sometimes seemingly too quickly, our times can pass. What we do with the time between a dash is our legacy. Time is not fully valued unless every millisecond is understood for the indefinite resource that it is. There is a time to laugh, a time to cry, a time to work, and a time to rest. But at every time, you must be aware of what time it is. A coach's first instructions to their team as they enter competition is to always know time and score. But time comes first, because time is the most important component to determining the outcome of the situation. Lost time is the only thing that cannot be recovered. But mastery of time can propel you to unimaginable heights. Check this out to see what I mean. Today, time management is no longer just logical. Today, time management is emotional. And how our feelings of guilt and fear and worry and anxiety and frustration, those things dictate how we choose to spend our time as much as anything that's in our, in our calendar or on our to-do list. In fact, you can't manage time. Time continues on whether we like it or not. So there is no such thing as time management. Really, there is only self-management. Early time management thought was all about, it was one-dimensional, and it was all based on efficiency. And the idea with efficiency was that if we could develop tools and technology to help us do things faster, then theoretically, that would give us more time. Well, there's nothing wrong with efficiency, all things being equal, efficiency is, is better. And yet there is an unfortunate limitation to efficiency as a strategy for time management. And, and it's evidenced very well by the fact that we all carry around miniature computers in our pockets, and yet somehow we're still never caught up. And for the last 20 years, this has really been the pervasive mode of thinking as it relates to time management theory. And it's not that there's anything wrong with prioritizing. In fact, prioritizing is as valuable a skill, a skill today as it ever has been in history. And yet, even though we throw that word around like it's the end all be all to time management theory, well, unfortunately, maybe that's not really the case because there is a massive limitation to prioritizing that nobody ever talks about, and that is this. There's nothing about prioritizing that creates more time. All prioritizing does is take item number seven on your to-do list and it bumps it up to number one, which is valuable in and of itself, but it doesn't do anything inherently to create more time. Multipliers instead ask the question, what can I do today that would make tomorrow better? What can I do right now that would make the future better. They're making the significance calculation. See, while when I say multiply your time, that might sound a little bit su superfluous. It might sound like an over-exaggeration, but it really is not. Now, while it is true that we all have the same amount of time inside of one day, 24 hours, 1,440 minutes, 86,400 seconds. And there's nothing that any of us can do to create more time in one day. But that's exactly the problem. That type of thinking is the problem. What we have to do is break out of that paradigm and instead think about tomorrow. And that brings us to the premise for how you multiply time. 
The way that you multiply time is simple. You multiply your time by giving yourself the emotional permission to spend time on things today that give you more time tomorrow. The significance calculation changes everything. Basically, beyond love, time is the most valuable resource that we have on Earth. We have likely encountered the tools of time management, but intentionality towards your personal goals and values will unlock the realm of time mastery. Life really begins when we understand and value the importance of every moment. Each second becomes an opportunity to move our destiny forward if we can tap into the mastery of time. Multiply, verb, to make many or manifold, to increase the number or quantity of. Practicality will multiply your endeavors.